thank you very much to the to the organizers of this uh, of this conference. It's uh, it's an honor to speak here. So uh, this is uh, the title of my talk. Uh, so the interior of dynamical vacuum black holes. I, I can even read it there. And uh, the strong cosmic censorship. I think it's on, but it's just a bit weak. So, um, and the strong cosmic censorship conjecture in general relativity. So this talk is actually an introduction to the next talk uh, by Jonathan Lu. But uh, at the same time, it is an excuse to uh, touch upon various of the main conjectures in, in the field of, of general relativity. So uh, if you want, the, the, I hope this talk serves a, a dual role. All right, with, with that said, let me um, begin by warning you of the outline of the talk. So the topics that I want to discuss, namely the fact both cosmic censorship conjectures, they naturally arise from comparing the Schwarzschild and Kerr solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation. So I'm going to begin by reminding you the basic properties of these solutions and how the cosmic censorship conjectures, both weak and strong, how they arise. Uh, so my emphasis in this talk will be more on, on, on the strong cosmic censorship. And there's a, now a <coughs> tradition of uh, maybe almost 40 years of study of, of this conjecture from the point of view of linearized and also nonlinear toy models. So I'm, I'm going to review what, what we've learned from such models and sort of the, uh, the view from the point of view of those models. And then uh, in the third part of the talk, and this is really the introduction to Jonathan's talk, to the next talk, um, I'm going to essentially uh, uh, formulate a, a definitive result uh, which concerns the, uh, the question of strong cosmic censorship in a neighborhood of the Kerr solution. Um, so this is sort of moving away from toy models to the actual problem. And finally, I will say what, what's left to be done to complete this. Okay, so uh, this being said, let me begin with... Uh, my introduction to Schwarzschild, Kerr, and the cosmic censorship conjecture. So everyone here is more or less familiar with Schwarzschild solution, but let me nonetheless just remind you what are the pertinent points from the point of view of this talk. So we are also celebrating the 100th anniversary of Schwarzschild. It was discovered barely a month after <coughs> uh, the final formulation of the Einstein equations. December 1915, and from the modern point of view, we should consider this a family of spherically symmetric vacuum space times, which evolve, so they are the maximum Cauchy development of two-ended asymptotically flat Cauchy hypersurface sigma, and we can depict them uh, in the sort of now standard Penrose diagram um, representation uh, as the, the, the diagram that I've drawn. And the properties that I want to remind you of are the following. So first of all, as we all know, this space-time is geodesically incomplete. However, at the same time, future null infinity, this uh, idealization of faraway observers in the radiation zone, future null infinity is complete. So that's to say that faraway observers in the radiation zone, or gravitational experiments, whatever, they can go on forever. Okay. So, um, so future null infinity is complete. Uh, moreover, the past of future null infinity has a, a non-empty complement. This is the celebrated black hole region. The boundary of the past of future null infinity is what we call the event horizon. It's here denoted H+. Plus. And actually, all incomplete observers in the space-time, so I've depicted one, gamma, uh, they necessarily must cross <coughs> the event horizon into this black hole region. So, uh, so that's, if you want, the first group of properties of Schwarzschild that I want to recall. But 
there's a second group of properties that I want to recall, which is the following. There's a very good reason why this manifold is geodesically incomplete. Uh, you see, all incomplete observers are actually torn apart by tidal deformations as their uh, sort of time of existence, uh, uh, as their sort of proper time uh, approaches its, its uh, supreme. So it, it is often said uh, that uh, observers approach a curvature singularity. But actually we all know from PDE that curvature blowing up in L infinity is not particularly relevant in the dynamics of the Einstein equation. So in some sense curvature blowing up, if that's all you know, that's not necessarily even a singularity. Um, but this is a very, very strong singularity, so it certainly is a terminal singularity of, of the space-time. And there's a, there's a way to geometrize this fact, which uh, embarrassingly was only proven uh, a few months ago by Jan Zbierski, who is in the audience. Uh, and the way to geometrize this statement is the following. This manifold is inextendable uh, even simply as a manifold with continuous Lorentzian metric. So what that means is that this, this, you should think this is sort of blow up at the level of C0 of the metric, not just the level of C2. Okay. So uh, this is a very strong singularity, which destroys all observers. And the final sort of property that I want to explicitly <coughs> emphasize is the causal character of the singularity. In Schwarzschild, it, it is space-like. Okay. So to review, Schwarzschild, as so we all know, geodesically incomplete, but null infinity is complete. There's a black hole region bounded by an event horizon, and all incomplete observers, they, they must enter the black hole. And conversely, all observers that enter the black hole are incomplete. Moreover, all observers entering the black hole are eventually torn apart by infinite tidal deformations. Uh, and uh, to say it, a related statement, the Lorentzian manifold is inextendable to a larger one across this singularity, <coughs> even simply as a Lorentzian manifold with <coughs> continuous mode. Okay, that's Schwarzschild. So already from the point of view of Schwarzschild, um, I can discuss the conjecture that we now know as weak cosmic censorship, which is due to Roger Penrose. Um, so, in the early days of general relativity, one could hope that all these funny properties of Schwarzschild, the entirety of them, uh, they are just um, artifacts of the strong degree of symmetry of the Schwarzschild solution and would go away upon perturbation of initial data. And that uh, widely <coughs> held expectation was uh, spectacularly falsified by the celebrated incompleteness theorem of Penrose, which uh, I guess we celebrate its, its 50th anniversary this year. So, um, so as an immediate corollary of, of his uh, incompleteness theorem, uh, it follows that uh, any spacetime arising from small perturbation of the initial data that leads to Schwarzschild <laughs> is again geodesically incomplete. So geodesic incompleteness is something that you have to live with. And from that point of view, then it turns out that Schwarzschild has a lot of redeeming features. And in particular, first and foremost, the fact that even though the space-time is geodesically incomplete, future null infinity is complete. Okay? So there is a completeness there. And um, the so-called weak cosmic censorship conjecture, well, these names have a long history, and let me try not to go into that. But I will call this particular formulation, the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, says that this happens always or, well, actually generically. That's to say, uh, for generic initial data, all but an exceptional set of initial data, then the resulting vacuum spacetime has a complete future null infinity. So it may have a complete future null infinity because the solution disperses, like Minkowski space, it may have uh, an event horizon, but whatever happens, faraway observers, they live forever. So uh, in the language of PDE, you should think of this as the global existence 
conjecture in general relativity, which is still compatible with Penrose's uh, incompleteness theory. Okay. So, in reality, we have very little uh, uh, sort of understanding of why this conjecture should be true in the generality that it's conjectured, because generic initial data, well, that's a very large space of initial data, and we have access to uh, very small windows on it. Uh, in fact, the only uh, setting in which we really have any good intuition for mechanisms that could make this true uh, is a certain toy model problem, uh, which was studied over many years by Christodoulou, the Einstein scalar field system under spherical symmetry. So, in fact, he proved that the analog of this conjecture under spherical symmetry, that's to say when everything is reduced spherically symmetric, so generic is understood in the world of spherical symmetry, then this, this conjecture is true. And in fact, it is in the context of that model uh, where he also showed that there exist exceptional initial data for which future null infinity is not complete. And this is why uh, one necessarily must add the word generic. Um, of course, I should add that for the vacuum equations, there are no uh, spacetimes known arising from uh, admissible asymptotically flat initial data for which future null infinity is not complete. But uh, given the, that there is an analogy between the Einstein scalar field system and the vacuum equations, it's reasonable to expect that there probably are, given Christodoulou's results. Okay. Uh, so this is the, the weak cosmic censorship, and I just talk about it in some sense in passing, because as I said at the beginning, I would be mostly interested in another cosmic censorship conjecture. Um, so this, uh, this uh, toy model is something that, as I said, lives in spherical symmetry, but we all know that many of the most <coughs> interesting phenomena in the subject uh, only occur outside of spherical symmetry, at least for the vacuum. And in particular, the Schwarzschild explicit solution itself, it sits inside uh, the larger non spherical symmetric Kerr family, uh, which was discovered much, much later um, because of essentially its, its algebraic subtlety. So we are, I guess, celebrating the 52nd anniversary <coughs> of the Kerr family. So what do I want us to recall about the Kerr family for the purpose of this talk? Well, just like Schwarzschild, these spacetimes are again. So in my semantics, uh, I, when I say the Kerr spacetime, I always <coughs> mean, for the experts, the, the maximal development of Kerr initial data. Okay? So it is the darker shaded region depicted here. So spacetime is again geodesically incomplete, just like Schwarzschild. But again, fortunately, uh, future null infinity, script I plus, is complete. And again, the spacetime has a, a non trivial black hole region, which uh, is uh, depicted here in the Penrose diagram. But if you want, uh, here is where the similarity ends. Um, if you look at why the spacetime is geodesically incomplete, it, the reason is completely different. And in fact, this spacetime is uh, extendable, in fact, smoothly. In fact, as a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations to a larger spacetime, this is the lighter shaded region depicted in this Penrose diagrammatic representation, such that all inextendable observers in the original spacetime can live another day in the other spacetime. Moreover, however, these extensions are severely non unique. And this is exactly why the Kerr spacetime in my semantics is, is the darker shaded region. This is the region which is, uh, if you want, determined by Kerr initial data. So, uh, so uh, we call the boundary of the original uh, spacetime in such an extension a, a Cauchy horizon because it is a horizon for the validity of the Cauchy problem. So, um, so this uh, generates the question, well, what happens to observer gamma, or what happens to the spacetime, <coughs> if you want? Uh, this is not predicted by the theory on the basis of initial data. So 
you might think that uh, this situation is much better than uh, the situation of Schwarzschild in particular. Uh, sort of, Schwarzschild has a singularity, singularities are bad, <coughs> right? Uh, whereas here, at least in these semantics, everything is completely regular, there's no singularity. But um, from the point of view of the bureaucrats, it's much better to know what happens to every observer. And in the Schwarzschild case, everyone is accounted for. Observers, they either live forever or are torn apart by infinite tidal forces. In the Kerr case, uh, there are some observers that somehow get away from the domain which is predicted by sort of <coughs> the initial value. And because in some sense uh, we prefer our, our theories to be like bureaucracies, um, the Kerr case is actually in some sense more problematic than the Schwarzschild. And uh, this motivates uh, uh, another conjecture also originally formulated by Panos which uh, I will state as follows. Um, well, essentially the statement is that the curse situation is a fluke and uh, generic asymptotically flat initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations, they always lead to a space-time which is inextendable as a suitably regular Lorentzian manifold. Now, uh, let me say at the onset that uh, Kerr spectacularly fails the predicate of this statement. It is uh, extendable, in fact, it's extendable as a smooth Lorentzian manifold solving the Einstein <coughs> equations. Um, so this, this conjecture certainly is, would say in particular that the, the Kerr behavior is non-generic. Of course, it says a lot of other things about uh, sort of uh, uh, generic <coughs> initial data. This is a, sort of a huge domain of validity for the conjecture to supposedly be true. Let me say moreover that uh, I've made this conjecture a little bit vague as to uh, in what sense should we uh, conjecture that it cannot be extended. That's to say what regularity assumptions we should make. Uh, so you can imagine a hierarchy of stronger and stronger versions of this conjecture and we'll get back to this later on. So. A brief word about the nomenclature that, again, these conjectures inherit their traditional names, but this is not a, a stronger statement than weak cosmic censorship as I formulated it. You should really think of this as global uniqueness in general relativity, contrast with global existence uh, in, in the sense that I said. All right, so this is, um, this is the conjecture. Uh, you might wonder, uh, was it simply wishful thinking that led Roger Penrose to conjecture this? No, uh, he actually discovered a very beautiful mechanism uh, which suggested that this could possibly be true, at least in a neighborhood of Kerr. And, uh, well, this is well known to many of you. This is the celebrated blue shift effect, which you can think of as dual to the celebrated red shift effect at the event horizon. So, we have two observers, Alice and, and Bob. Um, Alice is headstrong and falls into the black hole and goes straight to the Cauchy horizon. Bob, who wrote a textbook on general relativity, knows much better and uh, safely stays outside the black hole region. So the observers here are depicted uh, on this Penrose diagram representation. So if Bob sends a signal at constant frequency as he measures it, and you see at what frequency uh, Alice picks up his signal, then uh, as Alice approaches her Cauchy horizon crossing time, the signal is infinitely shifted in frequency to the blue. Um, so what Penrose argued is that uh, this effect, you can think of this as a geometric optics approximation to behavior of wave equation, Wave equation, in turn, you can think of it as naive model of the linearization of the Einstein equations. So this, uh, he argued that this would cause solutions of the wave equation to blow up in some way on a fixed curve background at the Cauchy horizon. Okay. 
and this is possibly an instability mechanism uh, that could make strong cosmic censorship true, at least in the neighborhood of the, of the curve family. All right, now let me uh, add a few words to what I just said. Of course, in linear theory, as a, as a mother of principle, the worst thing that can happen to linear perturbations on a, on a globally hyperbolic spacetime is that they can blow up at the, at the boundary of the spacetime. Okay? They can never blow up sort of in the, in the interior. So the worst thing that can happen uh, for any linear perturbations is that they blow up on the Cauchy horizon. But one might wonder whether in the full nonlinear theory governed by the Einstein equations, there's some threshold after which you know, linear perturbations become big, nonlinearities, they start to become important, and they force blow up to actually occur <coughs> before Cauchy horizon has the chance to form, uh, making the singular boundary space-like. And this was something widely subscribed to by <coughs> various people, explicitly and unexplicitly, some of the people uh, are mentioned here. One of the reasons this was widely subscribed to was that there was somehow a feeling in the air, at least in certain places, that singularity should be space-like and moreover they should subscribe to some specific uh, profile. So, in view of that, the natural working hypothesis uh, embraced by many people was that the generic dynamic solutions of the Einstein equations in a neighborhood of curve would actually revert to the Schwarzschild picture. Okay. So this, this was often said. And if you want, this uh, motivates a, a very strong formulation of strong cosmic censorship uh, that basically says that uh, when you formulate strong cosmic censorship, uh, inextendability should be understood just as in Schwarzschild. That's to say you should have a strong singularity across which the metric not only, you know, uh, not only does the curvature blow up, not only, the metric is inextendable even as a continuous metric. So observers are really torn apart. Okay, that's what that means. And moreover, the, the, the singularity is space-like. So this is what I would call a very strong cosmic censorship. Okay. It's exactly that state. Somehow, again, a cartoon of the statement is that the Schwarzschild behavior as far as the strength of singularity and its causal nature is generic. And I should add that actually the, the analog of this formulation of strong cosmic censorship was indeed proven by Christothulu for the spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field model together with his proof of weak cosmic censorship that I mentioned. Okay? So this is, you know, in some sense, there, there was some evidence for this in that model problem. <coughs> okay, so that's... Um, that's my uh, introduction to the weak and strong cosmic censorship conjectures, which is motivated by various properties of, of, of Schwarzschild and Kerr. So, as I said, I'm going to focus on the question of strong cosmic censorship, and I'm going to begin with uh, the intuition and previous work that was done in the context of linearized theory and nonlinear toy models, before going to the real problem. So, um, so first of all, a lot of this uh, toy stuff, but not all, but a lot of this toy stuff will not even concern Kerr, but will concern a spherically symmetric proxy for Kerr. So most of you are familiar with the fact that there's a spherically symmetric family of solutions of the Einstein-Maxwell equations, the so-called Reiser-Nordstrom family, uh, which shares the same Penrose diagram as Kerr and is in some sense, uh, easier to analyze because of its spherical symmetry. So, in fact, on uh, this simpler spherical symmetric background, the Penrose's um, heuristic blow-up argument that I described uh, uh, previously can be turned into the following theorem for solutions of the linear wave equation. This actually, uh, in, in this formulation, was only proven very recently by uh, Luke and O, both of, both of whom are here today. So the statement is, if you start with uh, compactly supported data on a Cauchy hypersurface, which is asymptotically flat, for sub-extremal Rice or Nordstrom, then uh, generic solutions, which have compact support initially, 
uh, they will fail to have finite local energy on the Cauchy horizon. Okay? So they, they will fail to be an H1 lock, PD language. Now, I should mention that actually the first result of this uh, type was by a student of Penrose McNamara. And this is uh, also a, a rigorous theorem. It just cannot uh, characterize this in terms of generic solutions uh, of the Cauchy problem of compact support. But it's again a theorem of this type. There was also some work that I did in this direction. So, uh, actually, this, this statement in the Kerr case. Uh, that's to say, uh, the statement for generic solutions of compact support um, is still not known. should add some uh, other comment about this theorem, that actually this theorem gives a characterization of um, when the energy blows up in terms of uh, final um, quantities on future null infinity. So for whatever it's worth, uh, observers at future null infinity uh, sort of know whether particular solution of the wave equation is exceptional or not. Anyway, um, so that's great. So that seems to be completely in, in the domain of um, supporting blow-up instability, <coughs> etc. But it turns out that the blow-up of the above theorem is actually indeed very weak. And um, this is a theorem, a recent theorem of a uh, student of mine, Anne Franzen, who will defend her thesis in, in a week in Utrecht. And this theorem is actually in both the Reisner and Nordstrom, but also the Kerr case in the full subextremal range. <coughs> and the theorem says the following. If you start with uh, uh, asymptotically flat uh, Cauchy hypersurface for Kerr, and you have compact support, the support can be arbitrary, of um, solution to the linear wave equation, then the amplitude of the solution is uniformly bounded everywhere, including the black hole interior, all the way up to the Cauchy horizon. And in fact, you can extend continuously the solution uh, to, the, to the Cauchy horizon. So again, the first result of this type for sort of fixed spherical harmonics on Reiser Nordstrom uh, is again due to McNamara from way back. But actually, that, that result was not uh, noticed as much as it should have been. And I should mention that there's actually a recent extension of this to the extremal case uh, by um, Day and Gaich. And the extremal case is, is very, very interesting, but I don't have time to talk about it. So, of course, this result in the Kerr case uh, uh, requires that you first understand everything about the behavior of scalar waves on the, on the black hole exterior. And uh, in particular, it appeals to a recent result of mine with Rodniansky and Schlappentoff Rothman, uh, where we proved, among <coughs> other things, polynomial decay rates for tangential derivatives of C on the event horizon that are used as, as an input in this thing. OK. So I, I, I suspect that there will be a bigger discussion on sort of the exterior story and the talk of Holtzegel a few days from now. All right, so where do, where do these two results leave us? Well, if one naively extrapolates the behavior of the linear wave equation <coughs> on fixed background to the full nonlinear Einstein vacuum equations, identifying the scalar field C with the metric and the derivatives of C with the Stoffel symbols, this suggests that uh, possibly the metric will extend continuously to a Cauchy horizon. That's to say that the Cauchy horizon will survive and the metric will, in fact, extend continuously beyond there. However, the Christoffel symbol should blow up. And in fact, if you're paying attention, uh, remember, the scalar field did not have local energy. That means the Christoffel symbols should not be particular square integral. So that will make the boundary of, of space-time <coughs> something that one could call an essential null singularity. Uh, traditionally, that was called in the literature a weak null singularity. But that's actually a, a, an unfortunate name because it's, it's pretty strong. Uh, in particular, uh, the Einstein equations uh, do not make sense weakly at such a singularity. So it's maybe better to call it an essential null singularity. Um, in any case, that's semantics aside. <coughs> 
On the other hand, if you believe the original intuition, in particular the sort of intuition associated with these names, then that would suggest that, well, okay, linear, linear stuff is great, but at the end of the day, the nonlinearities will finally win, and they will induce blow up earlier, <coughs> so as to form a space-like singularity in accordance with very strong cosmic censorship, which moreover you know, will be a very strong singularity, stronger, uh, much stronger than, than the behavior uh, said there. That's to say the metric will not be extendable continuous. <coughs> so the question is which, uh, which of the two scenarios hold? So the sort of Toy Story is not over yet. So before going to the, to the, to the real story, uh, there is something that one can learn about this uh, in, in a certain toy land. So uh, in particular, there is a nonlinear toy model that one can study. So on the one hand, this toy model is more restrictive than the linear results that I've said because this toy model will be spherically symmetric. Everything will be spherically symmetric. Whereas the results I've told you are about non-spherically symmetric solutions or non-spherically symmetric fixed background. On the other hand, um, this will be a, a fully non-linear model. So in fact, this is a, a generalization of Christodoulou's model, or the model that he pioneered, the Einstein scalar field system, um, under spherical symmetry. So this is simply the model where, well, in addition to the scalar field, you couple in a maximum. <coughs> and to make things as simple as possible, you couple it in only gravitation. Okay? That's to say, you don't consider the scalar field charged. The scalar field is real, so it does not directly interact with the maximum. But everything is coupled uh, sort of on the right-hand side of the Einstein equations. So this is the, the einstein maxwell <coughs> scalar field system. And the point about this system is that, in principle, even under spherical symmetry, it admits Cauchy horizons coming from the point at infinity because Reisner Nordstrom is an explicit solution of this system uh, when psi equals zero. Okay. In contrast, uh, actually, it's, it's, it's easy to prove that the Einstein scalar field system pioneered by Xotolu, it never uh, admits Cauchy horizons from, from the point at infinity. So somehow, you cannot study this, this problem, in some sense, in, in, in that early. So, well, let me just flash what the equations look like in, in, in spherical symmetry. Um, so in spherical symmetry, a, a good way of writing these equations is uh, in double null coordinates. And in some sense, there are, you can write them so there are three unknowns, uh, two metric functions, omega and r, and the scalar field. And they satisfy this system of what you could call 2Ds, so it's PDs in 1 plus 1 dimensions. Uh, the only thing I want you to remember from this is that for, th for the experts in the, in, in the room, there's a lot of null structure in these equations, and that will be a common theme in, in, in the next talk, which will talk about the vacuum equations in this side. Okay. Anyway, I don't expect you to gain much from staring at those for, for less than a minute. So, so let me tell you what's true about that model problem before continuing. So first of all, uh, of course, I, we want to understand what happens in the black hole interior, but you first have to understand everything about the exterior, just like for the wave equation. I mean, to prove the result of, of Anna, uh, one first had to understand the, sort of the decay of the waves on the event horizon. So uh, this is actually an a ancient now result of mine with uh, Rodnianski. And uh, in fact, you can state a completely general result for this, for this system. So <coughs> consider general asymptotically flat, spherically symmetric initial data uh, with two asymptotically flat ends. So actually, uh, in this system, if you want the Maxwell field to be non-trivial and you want the data to be asymptotically flat, then you necessarily have to have two ends, okay? Because the charge has to be sitting on non-trivial topology. So, in the, you know, given this restriction, this is, you know, completely general <coughs> initial data. So there's no, this is general initial data. So the statement is the following: uh, future null infinity 
So there's a typo, so it should read script I plus is complete. And uh, so there should be a script I plus there, and you should scratch this. And uh, a future complete two component event horizon forms, okay. just like in Reiser, Nordstrom, or Schwarzschild, okay. such that along both these components of the horizon, the geometry will tend to, well, <coughs> two different sub extremal Reiser Nordstrom metrics. Moreover, on this dynamic background, the scalar field, which is coupled in, will decay polynomially at a sufficiently fast rate, and actually we, in some sense, we proved the short rate for this, but all you need to know is that the polynomial power of the rate, this is with respect to a natural eddington finkelstein type coordinate, uh, is strictly bigger than one. Okay, that's all that we'll need to know for later. So I should add that I said that future non-infinity is complete, so this statement includes a weak cosmic censorship or whatever it's worth, as I've stated it for this model. But I should also add that uh, for spherically symmetric self gravitating systems, in general, once you have a trapped surface, uh, there's a general argument that allows you to infer the completeness of future null infinity as long as the matter model is sufficiently tame. So it's a much softer result, the statement of weak cosmic censorship. And the reason is simply that there is no center. The reason that weak cosmic censorship is so difficult in Stavoulou's model is precisely because of the set. Okay. So this is, in some sense, what you need to know about the exterior. And given that, um, the following uh, theorem, also ancient, uh, was proven. Uh, so for all data in the previous theorem, there is indeed uh, a non-empty piece of uh, Cauchy horizon emanating from the point at infinity, across which the metric is extendable continuously. Okay. So, in this model, uh, there is uh, uh, a piece of Cauchy horizon. However, if you assume in addition a certain lower bound of the same form as the upper bound for the decay rate of the scalar field on the event horizon, then this Cauchy horizon is indeed an essential null singularity. Right? So, in particular, the metric is inextendable as a Lorentzian manifold beyond in C2, the curvature blows up. But as I said, curvature blowing up from PDE point of view means nothing. If I just tell you that the curvature blows up. So, the stronger statement that the Lorentzian manifold is inextendable with locally L2 Christoffel symbols holds. And the scalar field is also inextendable in the analogous sense. So, as a in H1 log, so it necessarily has infinite local energy. Okay. Now, let me say something about uh, uh, part two. So, part two is conditional in the sense that you have to assume that there is a lower bound. This lower bound is conjecturally true for generic initial data. And in fact, a, a generalization of that was proven by Luke O in their linear model. Okay. So, uh, so you can expect us to say that you can replace two, two with just the assumption that the initial data on the space like hypersurface is generic. Okay? And I, I, <coughs> I think that this defect will be uh, closed very soon. So I should also add that uh, this theorem proved uh, uh, rigorously an uh, expectation that had been fielded uh, in the literature and dubbed mass inflation. In fact, there's a parameter called the, the Hawking mass, or in this context you could call it the misner sharp mass, you could probably call it other things. Um, uh, this blows up on, on the Cauchy horizon, and this in some sense is another way of characterizing the, the level of singularity. So that uh, scenario is originally uh, was entertained uh, and argued for by Poisson in Israel and, and Amos Ori, and there, there's also a, a, a great deal of numerical Relativity work on precisely this model that sort of preceded these, these old results. And I should also mention that uh, uh, there's a very interesting thing that happens in the cosmological, in the case where you have a positive cosmological constant. Um, and uh, I don't want to get into it, but there's been some recent work that proves analogs of these results in, in, in that case. And the 
Some of the authors of those are, are here, and you can ask them about it. So in particular, what does this say? This says that for the toy model, for the spherically symmetric toy model, the analog of very strong cosmic censorship is indeed false. On the other hand, modulo the open problem of uh, obtaining this, this condition on the horizon, um, then um, uh, the solution, at least uh, um, across this part of the singular boundary, although you can actually show that the rest of the singular boundary is, is easy to understand, um, is inextendable as a manifold with locally L2 Christoffel symbols. So this uh, motivated Christodoulou to suggest a reformulation of strong cosmic censorship where uh, you formulate it in terms of this notion of inextendability. That's to say that the, the maximal Cauchy development should be inextendable as a manifold with uh, uh, Christoffel symbols locally in, 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 in L2. Um, of course, this is weaker than the very strong cosmic censorship, but it at least would guarantee that extensions cannot be interpreted as weak solutions of the Einstein equation. So it would mean that there is still a unique, even weak solution of the Einstein equation solving the initial value problem. Um, now, one cumbersome thing with this, um, with this notion of inextendability is that it's, it's hard to characterize because you have to show that in any coordinate system, the, that there does not exist a coordinate system such that the metric extends continuously, but the Christoffel symbols are locally in L2. So uh, that's, uh, you know, it goes with the territory, so to speak, if you're forced to, to deal with these type of formulations. Okay, let me just give one other result about toys, um, which, um, which was actually not um, really discussed in, in, in the heuristic setting, but this is sort of the more recent theorem of mine about this toy model. So let's, uh, so the previous uh, theorems are for all initial data of this model. But let's actually look at initial data, which is sufficiently close to Rice and Orson initial data. Okay, so the scalar field is small and the geometry is close to Rice and Orson. So then the theorem is that there is in fact no space-like part of the boundary. The, uh, Penrose's diagram of the solution looks exactly like Reister Nordstrom, and it is globally extended, extendable uh, sort of across a bifurcate uh, Cauchy horizon as a Lorentzian manifold with continuous metric. Okay. So uh, that's to say, in, in the toy model, in moduli space, in a neighborhood of uh, the only explicit solutions that we have, there is no space like this. So, um, um, all right, so fine. Uh, the above results show that in the toy land, the naive extrapolation of linear theory was correct, and the sort of the other considerations were not correct. But, okay, this is toy land, and it can certainly be that all the above properties are artifacts of spherical symmetry. So, let's uh, leave toys behind now and go to the real problem, which is understanding generic dynamic vacuum black hole interiors without symmetry. So, uh, returning to the, <coughs> to the vacuum equations, bye-bye uh, to symmetry. Um, and so this is the problem that I, I want to study. But of course, just like with the toy model, if you want to say anything about the black hole interior, then you basically have to have already understood everything about the black hole exterior. Uh, but whereas uh, for the toy model, uh, this was uh, a theorem. Remember, the first theorem that I told you about the toy model was uh, the fact <coughs> that uh, sort of um, all, uh, for all initial data, the exterior regions, they, they settle down at polynomial rates to sub-extremal Rice and Nordstroms. Um, in the case of the vacuum, the analogous statement uh, even just in the neighborhood of current initial data is still a conjecture. So this is the celebrated nonlinear stability of the Kerr exterior conjecture. So the conjecture is that uh, space times arriving, arising in, in evolution under the vacuum equations for all 
initial delta, no symmetries, which is sufficiently close to current initial delta. Uh, they should indeed possess a complete null infinity. Uh, the past of null infinity should be bounded by an event horizon, and along the event horizon, and everywhere outside of it, the solution should asymptote, should settle down to uh, a nearby Kerr solution at a sufficiently fast polynomial rate. So this is the conjecture of nonlinear stability of Kerr. So there's actually been a lot of work, let's say, towards this conjecture in, in our community with contributions by many, many people. And uh, I'll defer to the talk of Gustav Holzegel, who I think will probably give a survey of that in, in his talk. Let me just note uh, uh, explicitly that this conjecture, of course, includes the statement of weak cosmic censorship, as I've stated it, uh, in a neighborhood of Kerr. Okay, so in particular, for initial data in the neighborhood of Kerr, uh, future null infinity is complete. Okay, it's included in this thing. All right. So that's, um, so, so that's just a conjecture. But uh, what I'm going to do uh, in the rest of this talk is I'm going to assume that this, co this conjecture holds. Okay, I'm going to assume this conjecture. And the, the, the theorem is then the following, and this is joint work with the, the next speaker, uh, Jonathan Luke from Cambridge. He's going to talk about this in his talk. Um, so the theorem is the following, that if indeed the nonlinear stability of the Kerr exterior holds, as I've stated it, then the Penrose diagram of Kerr is also stable. That's to say, all vacuum spacetimes m comma g that arise from asymptotically flat initial data, no symmetries, uh, which start from data sufficiently close to a, a rotating sub-extremal curve, um, they will in fact have a, a global bifurcate uh, Cauchy horizon across which the metric is continuously uh, extended. So, uh, in particular, uh, sort of. If, if the stability of Kerr exterior conjecture is true, then very strong cosmic censorship is false. Um, and uh, in a neighborhood of, um, of two-ended Kerr in the moduli space of solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation, there are no space-like singularities whatsoever. Okay. So this is the, this is the theory. Um, so, because Jonathan is, is, um, is going to give his talk, I'm not going to say really anything about uh, how this is proven. Uh, of course, it, it, it takes ideas from the toy problem, and you, know, you can see that there, there is a shadow of the difficulties uh, present in this theorem already in the toy problem. Um, but uh, I should also state uh, explicitly that the, this theorem really depends on some very recent work, uh, previous work due to, due to Jonathan, on the local construction of uh, weak null uh, so vacuum patches of space-time with uh, essential null singularities. Okay? So it's, it's um, in some sense, the proof combines uh, those two things. All right. Um, so I should also note that uh, our solution is actually more general. Of course, in gravitational collapse, uh, space-times do not arise from a Cauchy data with two asymptotically <laughs> flat ends. They sort of they arise from uh, uh, Cauchy data uh, of a space-time with one asymptotically flat end, which is initially very far from Kerr, and maybe the space-time collapses and uh, settles down to Kerr. And in fact, there is sort of a, a meta conjecture in the subject that in, in the vacuum case, uh, generic asymptotically flat initial data will eventually settle down to maybe finitely many curves moving, uh, moving away from each other. So actually our theorem uh, says the following, that any time you have a vacuum space-time settling down to Kerr, it could, as is the physical case, uh, be coming from one asymptotically flat uh, and through gravitational collapse. So if you just know that the black hole settles down to Kerr at a polynomial rate, then it will have a piece of Cauchy horizon emanating from the sort of 
time like infinity, across which the metric is inextensible. So if you put that together with uh, what's sometimes called the final state conjecture, that says that generic initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations, which is asymptotically flat, will either disperse or will necessarily have a piece of Cauchy horizon across which the, the matrix is uh, extendable continuously. But I should add that in this more general case, so you mean extendable, the, the metric is extendable, yes, oh good. Yeah, this is a, an embarrassing typo, so scratch in, scratch that. But I, I, I should add that uh, nothing is known about uh, the uh, rest of the boundary, nothing. So one often would hear uh, discussions of the picture of gravitational collapse where people would say that well, we definitely know that there is a space-like singularity in black holes and, well, there's this ongoing debate about whether there, there is such a piece here. But uh, in, in reality, uh, this, you know, <coughs> modulo conjectures that are believed universally, uh, the, the existence <coughs> of this piece is now a theorem. Uh, and this is as obscure as it always was. All right, so uh, let me end by saying uh, what is left to be done. Uh, so, well, the first open problem that's obviously left to be done is indeed to, to prove the nonlinear stability of, of Kerr. Uh, as I noted above, uh, a definitive disproof of very strong cosmic censorship um, would be an immediate corollary now of, of the above. And again, let me defer to the talk of Gustav Holzegel, who will, I think, give an overview of uh, where this community is uh, on the road to proving uh, this, this conjecture. And of course, the second problem, you'll notice that I conveniently have not said anything about in what sense this Cauchy horizon is singular. I've only said in what sense it's regular. I've said that uh, the, uh, the metric extends continuously beyond it. Um, I should add that uh, this is actually an important point to realize that somehow when it's very important that you can divorce the problem of understanding whether this boundary is singular at all from whether the space-time exists up until this boundary. Uh, it, it is often that, you know, one, in some sense, by calling these a priori singularities, you can miss this very important point, that showing the persistence of null boundary is not at all a question of understanding singularity. It is really a question of regularity. In any case, um, the open problem again, motivated by the toy model, is to prove that for generic initial data close to Kerr, these, this uh, singular boundary, uh, this boundary is indeed singular in the sense that uh, I said previously. That's to say, not only does the curvature blow up, that too, but not only that, uh, actually the, 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 the space-time is inextendable in in this stronger sense, that's to say, as a, as a space-time with locally square integral Christoffel sets. So if you can show uh, both open problems one and two, then a corollary will be the following. The Christodoulou formulation of strong cosmic censorship is true uh, in a neighborhood of the Kerr family. Remember, to show that a formulation of strong cosmic censorship is false, you just have to identify one open set of moduli space. Uh, where it's not true, uh, right, where the predicate is not true. Uh, to show that the, a version of strong cosmic censorship is true, you have to understand all of moduli space. Uh, that is maybe something for the, the next centennial of the subject. So with that, uh, <laughs> I end the talk. Thanks.
I have one question. Uh, is there any, any hope to replace this uh, Christodoulou in extendability by some more uh, geometric uh, definition? I mean, Christoffel symbols are not geometric, so. <laughs> well, there, maybe there is a way to say, to say the same thing in a more appealing way. Uh, you know, of course, it's the usual problem that we are below curvature, so you, know, you cannot say it in terms of you know, local invariance. Uh, like that, so yeah, I mean that's, and it necessarily must. So it's PDE theory, in some sense, tells tells one that uh, you know, if, and you know, it's 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 very interesting uh, because actually I alluded to the case of cosmological constant. Um, what appears to happen in the case of positive cosmological constant is that this version of strong cosmic censorship may not be true. Um, and that actually is, is very worrying. That's to say, there will still be some version which is true, which is weaker than this. But, uh, but the problem will be that the, the, sort of the singular nature of the boundary will still be within the well positiveness theory of PD. That will be a very interesting situation because it would say that, well, from PD theory, it's as if there's no singularity from the PDE theory of the classical equation. So you really then have to okay, wonder, maybe there's some other principle that tells you that this is singular, but it's not, it's really not the, cla the cl from the classical point of view, it's not. So, but I, I agree, it certainly would be nice, well, either to reformulate this or even just to develop a toolbox for proving something like this. I, let me also mention one other thing from my, my first, uh, slide, even showing the statement that um, Schwarzschild is an extendable as a continuous <coughs> Lorentzian manifold, um, which is a fine geometric statement. Uh, well, this actually uh, required the introduction of some very nice new ideas in, in Lorentzian geometry that don't seem to have uh, occurred, at least uh, to my knowledge. Uh, so it, it, I think it's actually a, an interesting question for Lorentzian geometers to, you know, to sort of develop techniques that will allow us to actually prove these type of statements. They're not easy to prove even, you know, even if at the level of um, <coughs> analysis it seems to be true. It's sort of geometrically characterized. Any question? Yes. <coughs> yes. Coming back to the previous question, if you're talking about the Christoffel symbols, you're talking about the connection, right? And yes. so presumably there is something about the behavior of geodesics which is implied here. But geodesics might not, uh, that's to say, you, you don't have, somehow, you don't have existence of geodesics in, in, this, uh, in this setting in general. If you just sort of have a uh, Lorentzian, um, if you just have a Lorentzian manifold with locally square integral Christoffel symbols, then you don't have sort of, well, the existence of classical geodesics. Now, okay, there could be some, you might be able to find some sort of types of null geodesics, et cetera, by various variation arguments. But you do, you're not in, you, in any case, you're not in the domain of the sort of, the, the usual ODE theory uh, for uh, sort of constructing geodesics. Um, which is exactly one of the reasons why it's so difficult to actually show that this type of a statement is true. No more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. And <laughs> and we meet again at 11 sharp.